we are still in our promises series, and we will be up until Thanksgiving. Um, throughout this year, we've been unveiling the promises of God, and I came up with an assertion that I wanted to make. And uh, I, did, I did vet this through some of the heroes that have gone before us in G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and many theologians, and this is in line with something that they would say. But um, as we've gone through the promises of God, I was thinking about what, what are the purpose of the promises? What's, the, what's the, the hope that God has, the impact, the perlocution, right? What's, what's the hope that God has with speaking promises? And why would he speak promises anyway? What kind of God is this that, that if he's a God of honor and, and keeps his word, he's a God of truth, he voluntarily speaks things to put himself on the hook? for things. And he doesn't have to do that. But what is his hope in giving us promises? I believe his hope is that we would believe he is Lord. Think, think that through all the way back when God gives these promises. When God, uh, we look at the promises as God's revelation of himself. In his sovereign time, he reveals himself to mankind. And he makes these covenants and these promises. Every one of the promises secures our future, gives us peace and hope, gives us instruction for how to live in the blessings that he created us for, courage to handle the difficulties of the world, the promise of his presence. All these promises, what are they for? So we would believe that he is Lord. And when I look at Ephesians, this is where we're going to be here for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, and i got to be honest, when I read this, Ephesians 1, the first part that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, um, where I'll just read part of it here, where um, Paul says uh, to the holy people of Ephesus, right, calls them holy, and he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He's calling, us, he's calling them, and, and invoke as we read this, it's calling us to reflect on do we really reflect and count our spiritual blessings in Christ, the blessings in the heavenly realms. Do, do we count those? Like when I read these, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. We're holy and blameless. God has decreed that by his will, not by anything that we have done. Do I really reflect on that and count it as a blessing? In love, he predestined us for adoption to the sonship through Jesus Christ. And it is his pleasure and his will. Like, do I really count that as a heavenly? Do I really think of that as, oh, what a blessing that I am, a child of God? Do I really reflect on that and go, oh, what a blessing? And then to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our sins, and in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity of all things. Do I... I don't live every day that way. Sometimes I... I don't count any of this. I don't think of any of this as a blessing. I think of this sometimes as there's a theological idea that really makes a lot of sense when you put it in the framework of the Christian faith. But do I really internalize this? I find in moments where God gets my attention, I do. I find in the midst of suffering, I do absolutely depend on these promises for survival. How many of you said this? How many of you said that you're going through something difficult and you said, how do people that don't know Jesus, how do they get through this? 
I've said that so many, that, that tells me I am leaning on these eternal promises. And they're strong. They can handle my weight. They can handle my fear and my doubt, my pain, my suffering. And then on the other extreme, when we're celebrating something like the wedding of one of my children or the birth of a grandchild, I lean on these things because this miracle reminds me of one thing. He is God, and I am not. That's really good news. But in my day-to-day life, I think it's really easy for me, and I think all of us, to just forget that we walk and breathe every day with these blessings, these eternal blessings. And man, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people where I ask them, you know, how are you doing? And they talk about the Lord in their life and their only evidence of the Lord in their life is whether they got a job, they have income, they can, they're out of debt, or there's some type of blessing, or they're not sick, or the only way they know how to interpret whether or not they feel the presence of God is by these the physical blessings of the earth of, of, of our life. As I was just reflecting on that as I was preparing this week, like, man, how often do we look at our physical surroundings as, as the representation of whether or not God is with us or we are God's people? And Paul clearly is pulling our eyes up from this world and saying our blessing is eternal. Our blessing is in the heavenly realms. I give all that background because he he decides to open this letter with this reminder of these heavenly blessings. And then he gives a reason why in verse 15. For this reason... Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. He's saying you, it's like he's saying a couple things here. He's saying you are part of that heavenly blessing in me and I'm giving thanks. When I think of you, I'm giving thanks for you as as reminding me So he's both reminding himself and reminding them of this heavenly blessing. But then he goes further. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. That's the goal, that you may know him better. What is the point of all these revelations? That we would know him better. And what does it mean to know him better? That he is Lord. Because that's such good news for us every day. It also should cause us to tremble a little bit that he is Lord. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. If he is Lord and you are his, there is a hope that he has called us to, a purpose that's beyond ourselves. Last week we said when when God speaks, that which is his responds. And Paul is just invoking the same thing, like you are God's people, and I pray that you have the courage and the wisdom to respond to God when he speaks. The power, oh. guys. I don't know about you. When I when I read this stuff, sometimes I think, man. Sometimes I get so caught up in, like, in my seminary studies, trying to figure out how this fits in with the whole narrative of the Bible and the theology of that we're that we're living in. I just forget that this is deeply personal. This is deeply personal. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance of his people, and his, his incomparably great power for us to believe that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. There's a call back to the heavenly realms he talked about at the beginning of the chapter. Because Christ is there, we have these blessings. And the power that raised Christ is the same power in us. You see how he's, he's taking all of these heavenly blessings and he's putting a very fine point on it. He says, the power, it's the power in you. If you believe that God is Lord and you believe that you are his and you believe you have these blessings, the power in you can conquer death. Remember, we're talking about the blessings in the heavenly realms. As we kind of hearken back to the promises this is the Proto-Evangelion, the very first promise where the serpent strikes the heel of Eve. You remember that? Like this is, this is saying, even though the serpent, or the strikes the heel of the seed of Eve, right? We are, we're sharing in that inheritance of Christ. So even though in this world, as we walk with Christ, we will have serpents striking our heel. The power to overcome that, that Jesus exerted, is in us. Boiling this down, what does this mean for us today, I think? I think at least it means that whatever you're facing in life, there is a hope, there is a power for you to overcome that for it not to crush you. It will not take you down. You may have to endure something because we live in a fallen world. And I think at some level, we are all victims of someone else's sin. And we have all caused others to be victims of our sin. And that creates brokenness. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the power within us that we're set free. What are we set free from? We're set free from fear. We're set free from guilt. We're set free from shame. This is what it means. This is so prevalent, the way that Jesus and Paul talk about, and even, and even the prophets of the Old Testament, the way they talk about us believing that God is Lord and believing that we are his people. What happens when we believe that? Our old life is gone and a new life has come. We are a new creation in Christ. We have been dead to sin and raised to live in a new life. We're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Let not I, but Christ live in me. If we believe that, Jesus, that God is our Lord and we are his people and Jesus rose from the grave, we are set free. If you think about the things that are holding you back from living in the joy of freedom, it's fear, it's shame, it's guilt. But if we believe that we're set free, we have freedom to not let those things hold us back. And Paul is exhorting the Ephesians, remember the promises that God has fulfilled. In, in, we talked about, in this series, we talked about John the Baptist. When, he, when Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, he says that, you know, there's no greater man than John the Baptist, right? And there's no greater one fulfilling the purpose that God intended for him to do than John the Baptist. But then he says, but there will come those who will be greater. And he's talking about those on the other side of the resurrection. Those on the other side of this, this, this thing in, in where he's talking about John. He's like, this thing that's about to come, John is foretelling of it about to come. There will become one that will baptize you in spirit and in fire. I'm just baptizing you in water. John the Baptist is doing his thing. 
But the ones that come after are going to be greater. Why? Because they're going to be massively testifying about what happened to them. I have been set free. I am no longer bound by sin and shame and guilt and fear. I am a new creation in Christ. Testify to the world. Look, I'm changed. We are on the other side of the resurrection and we look back and we testify 2,000 years later that that thing that happened in history changed me today. And that's supernatural. And that can change you today too. And it frees us. The evidence of our belief is that it frees us from these chains. It frees us from the condemnation that we've heard other people heap on us and that we wrestle with. The shame, the criticism, that is a result of someone's sin. And it's spilled over on us. But those voices are loud, aren't they? Those ones that make us feel doubt and fear. Some of it is survival instinct that God made us. Like when you feel pain, you avoid the thing that causes you pain. But the discernment of the trust in the Lord and believing that he is God and that we are his and that we have the power of Christ inside of us. We take that and we go, well, I am God's people, therefore I have a purpose. And my purpose is to step into the darkness of pain and be a light of hope and love and grace. We're going to step into the darkness of this world. We're going to be a light because we're God's people. And this is the, this is the cycle, right? And as we consider stepping into that thing where we felt pain before, or stepping into that place that represents something that reminds us of someone who hurt us. As we think about going into that, there's going to be a very real enemy nipping at your heel, trying to remind you of the pain. And so we need these reminders like Paul to say, remember your heavenly blessings as you step in. We are God's people. We do God's purpose. And that is bringing hope to the hopeless. Loving the unlovable, loving our neighbor, loving ourselves, loving our friends, loving our enemies. This is hard and it's scary. But if we believe, see, do you see the beauty of God's love and his grace? That the purpose of all of this, you could say, as the promises of God are the, I was trying to figure out a better way to say this and I don't have one, so bear with me. I'll work on it. But it's like it's the skeleton on which the meat of life hangs. I don't know. But the promises of God is the framework. And it carries us through this narrative of God revealing himself more and more to us through this revelation. He chooses. He's sovereign. He doesn't have to reveal himself to us, but he does. If you look at the promises, it's this progressive revelation of who God is. Why does he do that? So we would know and believe that he is Lord and we would see what kind of Lord he is. Because if we see God, the way he's revealing himself to us as loving, forgiving, powerful, deeply committed to righteousness, truth, and justice, we see our role as his people. If he's our Lord and we're his people, if, we're his, if he's our king, we're his subjects. We do what the king decrees. And then we see, we're going to get into this rest of Ephesians, we see God has equipped each one of us to do a specific thing in and for his kingdom. And in doing that, we find our greatest purpose in life. And we don't know, I don't, and, and I don't want to slip into this thing that we tend to slip into when I say stuff like that, like God has called you to do something specific and you're equipped. To, we tend to think of vocation. What do I do as a job? Or we tend to think of where do I serve in the church? I'm not talking about that. 
I'm talking about there are unique opportunities for you to be God's representation in your life today, in the career that you choose that you enjoy, in the school that you love and you like to go to, in the church that you find community and a genuine love for one another. Like in that context, you have a purpose. It's beautiful because in fulfilling that purpose, we find the greatest satisfaction we will ever find on earth. It's the secret to joy. The secret to joy is purpose. Because think about it, when all the criticism comes at us, when we're through our trauma, through the people that have hurt us, through the, the insecurities we felt ourselves, through the, sometimes we just have hard time after hard time, and we start to interpret the world as if we're just somehow less than and not worthy of, because it gets harder and harder. And we kind of look at it and go, well, no one else is having a hard time, so it must be me. I might be the problem. But if we believe that we are God's people, and we believe that he is our Lord, and we see the kind of Lord that he is, we don't have to be defined by that. And you are free to not be defined by that. Remember that. You are free to not be defined by the critics in your life. You're free to not be defined by the sin in your past. You're free to be defined by your identity as God's person. And boy, when we come together as God's people, with the power that raised Christ from the dead in us, and we, and we work together, we do things like send a young man halfway across the world to change the lives of people in Africa. We do things like start a food pantry where we're serving 200 people a month. Like these are things that are way beyond what any one of us could do. And this is just a small taste. The thing that holds us back from that is all of that negativity that keeps telling us that we should fear that we should doubt that we aren't good enough and we have these negative repeated things. Uh, I've learned they're called ants, automatic negative thoughts, right? And they just pop up and they keep us, they keep us from doing what God has created us to do. We're like Moses who says, when God says, go and tell them, he says, I am, I am heavy tongued. I am a thick-tongued man, is what that means in Hebrew. I have a thick tongue. It means I can't speak. I can't, right? You know what God's response to Moses was? Do you remember this? God's response to Moses when he says, I can't do this. Give me my brother Aaron. I know, God, you're telling me I can. But in the moment, he says, I'm not going to believe that you are Lord. I'm going to believe that you're depending on me to do this. He says, God's anger burned towards Moses because Moses wasn't believing that he was Lord. But even in God's anger burning towards Moses, he extended Moses grace and love, and he never left him. He was with him. That's the kind of God we serve. He sees your inadequacies, and he doesn't leave you because of them. He's with you in them. He gets frustrated when you keep believing in your inadequacies and what you're telling yourself more than you're believing him. I, I'm really stuck on this, this kind of summary statement that the purpose of God's word, of his promises, of the Bible, of the church, of our call to evangelize, of the beauty of this world, it cries out one thing. He is Lord. Can you see it? And then reflect, think, what are the things that stop me from seeing it? I can promise you they're in the categories of fear, doubt, shame, somewhere in there. And the same power that rose Jesus from the grave is in you to set you free. You're free to love. You're free to serve. You're free to forgive. You're free. I always want to caveat this because of the world we live in. So I always like just to remind you all, so you've heard this a lot. 
Forgiveness doesn't mean there aren't consequences. Forgiveness means you're set free from feeling bitter. You're set free from feeling that the person who hurt you was right in, in treating you that way. You're set free from the person who offended you and living under the power of that offense. You're set free. You can trust God with that. So you're free to forgive. You're free to let go of the bitterness that controls you. You're free to live as righteous and pure. And for you to live that way, you must believe. So I want to encourage you to reread that first opening part of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 next week, but reread that and ask yourself, are these blessings, these eternal blessings that he's giving me an identity? And with that identity comes a purpose. And if you read them and they don't hit you, read them again and again and again. Let them, let them transform you. I believe that the world needs us now more than ever. I think there's a world out there that needs those of us who are God's people to be God's people indeed. In love, grace, patience, and truth, in the fruit of the Spirit, we're God's people. Let me pray. God, I thank you so much for your word. And I pray that as we reflect on this, on these heavenly truths, these eternal and heavenly truths, that you would let it tra transform us as Paul, the author, intended this reflection to do, that, that it would give us wisdom and courage, wisdom and courage to be your people. God, help us believe. Help us to frame the narrative of your, your miraculous intervention in our life, your provision for us, your grace towards us, your gifting, your bestowing gifts upon us, the blessing of the feeling of love and the blessing of the joy of music and the blessing of the beauty of art and the blessing of the comfort of a hug. God, those are your gifts to us that you bestow upon us here on earth because you have secured our eternal gifts. God, help us to look at all these blessings and attribute them to you and be reminded, remind ourselves of your grace and your mercy towards us. I pray for courage and wisdom as we go to be your church today, to be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen.